We are going to go ahead and get started first thing this morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here, for making the sacrifice at 9 o'clock this morning. On a nice January 28th morning, our speaker this morning is Father Sean Kukali. So he is a gift to our diocese. He's a, um, I'm very grateful that he was able to make it here this morning. He was, he's been in our diocese. He was ordained in 2005. He served at St. Joseph Parish along with North American Martyrs. And in 2013, he received his license, and I have to look at it, it's so long, <laughs> license in sacred theology at the John Paul II Institute for Marriage and Family Studies in Rome. And so he's now back with us. He's currently the director of the Family Office of Family Life. And again, let's welcome Father Sean Cacali. Thank you. Father. Thanks, sister. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we invite you into this space and ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon us to bind us to our Lord Jesus Christ, that every thought, word, and work of ours may begin with you and through you. Be happily completed through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. It's great to be back here at St. Joe's. Um, I think this is the second year that we've done this uh, confirmation, morning of recollection for you parents. Um, and so today, for the, about the first hour and a half, I'm probably just going to plow through an hour and a half and then we'll take a break. And uh, we're going to talk about this topic, Gospel of the Family, the Domestic Church, in sacramental preparation. And, um, and then in the second part, uh, I want to cover some basic things that... Sort of, it's a good time to review things like internet safety, education for love, and give you some resources as you're raising your kids in the modern world. A um, little bit about myself, for those of you who don't know me, I grew up in Michigan, and uh, my family um, looks kind of like this. So my dad grew up in Ireland uh, when he was 19. He met a woman and fell in love, and they had two daughters and a son. My sister Donna was born in England and then raised by her Italian grandmother in Ireland, and now she's married to an Italian who runs four Irish pubs in Rome. Uh, which is awesome when you're living in Rome. My sister Jacqueline was born in Ireland. Um, when Dad was 22, he moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma, because he had an uncle that lived there. Uh, his wife followed shortly thereafter, and my brother Mark was born in Tulsa. So when Mark was about two years old, uh, Dad and Mark's mom got divorced. Uh, Dad kind of abandoned that family. He moved around the country, lived in Memphis for a while, lived in New Orleans, met some people. They just happened to be moving to Michigan to work in the automobile factories, and Dad went with them. So meanwhile, my mom grew up in Michigan. When she was in high school, she fell in love with a boy, and they got married and had two sons, my brothers James and John. And when John was about two years old, they also got divorced. So dad makes it to Michigan, meets my mom. Yes, I was born. And then two weeks short of my second birthday, my mom died of cancer. So dad married a third time to my stepmom. And they had two daughters and a son, my sister Sarah, my sister Katie, my brother Kevin. And then when I was a sophomore in college, they also got divorced. Right? So that's how I became the Family Life Office Director. <laughs> but it's also the family that our Lord called me out of. Right? It's the family that I learned to pray in. You know, all of our vocations are formed in our families. And our families are the first place where we learn how to love. And that was the place that I learned how to love. You know, for good and for bad. Some things were good and some things not so good. And they had to be healed over time. Um, most of all, it's the family I learned how to pray in. And as a child, I used to pray Psalm 139 before I knew about Psalm 139, which says, Lord, I praise you for the wonder of my being. I praise you for I'm wonderfully made. And because as a kid, I would think about the fact that God had to go through a lot of trouble to make me. Right? He had to take my dad across an ocean through all these circumstances, get him to Michigan in order to meet my mom so that God could make me just in time before my mom died. And so I would sit and wonder at that. Like, why did you go through all that trouble to make me? You must have had a reason to make me. Jesus, why did you make me? And at about age seven, I started to think about being a priest. Um, and my logic for being a priest went kind of like this. I really want to meet this woman who gave birth to me, my mother. 
and my mother's in heaven. Therefore, I have to get to heaven. Therefore, I guess I'll become a priest because all priests go to heaven. Right? That's how we think when we're kids. When I got into high school, I got really involved with youth ministry, had sort of a conversion experience there, and started to feel like God was calling me to be a priest. And, uh, and so I started asking a lot of priests about going to the seminary, and they all had the same advice, which was, you know, you have plenty of time, just wait, you'll go after college, you have plenty of time. And so I had to go to college, and uh, we had about, you know, this much money saved up for college. Um, but I was really involved in school activities and had good grades, and I applied to Military Academy at West Point. Um, got into the Military Academy at West Point, after high school, so I spent four years there, studied Arabic and Middle Eastern studies, graduated in 1996, branched infantry, went to Fort Benning, Georgia, learned how to jump out of planes, went through Army Ranger School, ended up at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and I was there for two years. And so while I was there, my career was going great. You know, I was a rifle platoon leader for about six months, then I got moved to battalion support platoon leader, which was like the highest position you can have as lieutenant. And then I moved to the battalion S3 air job, which was sort of one rank above my current rank, which was also very good for my career. So my career was soaring and my heart was broken. Because at that time in my life, I was living with this tension of ever since I was a kid, I thought God wanted me to be a priest, but now I'm stuck in this military obligation and I can't do it for another five years. And so I sort of resolved that tension by staying distant from God and kind of running away from him and running towards sin. And eventually I found myself in a position where, you know, I was dating a girl who managed a bar that I used to go to. Um, she was feeling very serious. She wanted me to move in with her. And I was recognizing the contradiction in my own life. And I remember getting up in the morning and looking in the mirror and just saying, like, who are you? What happened to you? And I went on this long drive down to see my brother in Florida, and on my way back, I remember just kind of crying out to God and saying, Jesus, what do you want me to do? And him saying very clearly, I want you to be a priest, stupid. <laughs> I've always wanted you to be a priest. So I went straight to the church that I attended and went to the Marian shrine and prayed the rosary and basically just said, okay, Jesus, I'm going to ask one more time. And if the doors don't open, I'm moving on. I'm never going to ask again. This is the last time I'm going to ask about going to the seminary. Two days later, my chaplain was walking by my office. I stopped him. Chaplain, do you know any way I could get out of the army early to go to the seminary to become a priest and maybe come back in the army? And he said, oh, yeah, the chaplain priest recruiter is going to be here on Friday. Just happened to be that week. So I met with him, and then he says, oh, this is great. I came in from the field. I had camouflage on. I smelled really bad. And I found him at a meeting, and he's like, that's the kind of chaplain we want. Meet with me on Saturday. And he gave me all the paperwork I needed to fill out to get out of the Army right away. And then I was thinking to myself, crap. <laughs> like, now I actually have to do this. So I started filling out this paperwork where it starts leaking out. Um, a friend of mine came by. He introduced me to a spiritual director. And I went and met with him. And he is kind of this really assertive, gruff, spiritual director, priest from Kentucky. He wasn't in the army, but he kind of wanted to be. And uh, I remember him looking at me and being like, Sean, what does God want from you? Uh, I think he wants me to be a priest. Good, so do I. That means he does. <laughs> and then he throws this question at me. Where do you want to be a priest? And I didn't know that was an option. And I said, I'd probably go home where I grew up in Michigan. And he just looks at me and goes, Michigan, I don't know Michigan. Lincoln, you should go to Lincoln. I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, you should go to hell. <laughs> Why would I want to go to Lincoln, Nebraska? I thought it was like a cornfield with a football stadium in the center. So I came here to appease him, and it just felt like home. Um, I visited St. Greg's. I met a bunch of priests who have become great friends and um, and ended up staying here. I moved here in 1999. Uh, was ordained in 2005, spent four years teaching high school at Pius. Uh, first year here, and then it was time for me to go back in the army, and so I went to Bishop Bruskowitz and I asked him permission, and, uh, and he sort of responded to me, oh, you'll be great, you'd be great, you'll probably be a general, and your career will soar, but, bishops always have a but, 
He's like, but I think you should go to graduate school and study marriage and family and human sexuality. And, and I know you have a passion for marriage preparation and theology of the body. And, uh, and so you can do whatever you want, but I think you should go to grad school. And um, he made a promise of obedience. Right? So I ended up praying over this and I decided, yes, I'll go to grad school. And going to grad school at the John Paul II Institute definitively saved my priesthood. And, uh, and really formed me for the work that I'm doing now in amazing ways. Um, so I'm going to tell that story as we go along today. Um, when I got back in 2013, um, I was director of religious education for a year and then moved over to the family life office. So much of my work, as you all might be aware, is in the anti-pornography apostolate. Um, I started that really because when I left Rome, when I left here to go to Rome and I taught at Pius, the biggest distraction we had in class was kids texting during class, right? They could put their hand in their pocket, feel the buttons on their phone, send a message without even looking at their phone, right? I'd be up writing on the board and I'd get a text from one of my students um, during class. That was the biggest distraction, right? When I came back, everybody's got this thing in their pocket, they have screens, they have high-speed video, and really easy access to internet pornography, right? The age of exposure to internet pornography has dropped to about eight years old now for first exposure, and that's average, right? And so I started to do more work in that area. So this talk is not going to be a pornography talk, okay, in case you're worried. But I will talk about it as we go, um, because it is uh, a really important thing to be vigilant about, especially as your kids are past the age of first exposure and um, just kind of living in a world where things are, there's more and more and more temptation. Okay, so I want to start with thinking about baptism and the day you brought your child to be baptized, right? Some of you had your child baptized here, and some of you, I think I baptized your child. Um, so when your child was baptized, right, you came to the church, your family was all here, um, and that was the day that the Holy Spirit entered into your child's life for the first time, right? They became a child of God in that moment, right? They were born into the world naturally, and now they were supernaturally born into the kingdom of heaven. And during that ceremony, the priest gave you a candle, and he said this, Receive the light of Christ. Parents and godparents, this light is entrusted to you to be kept burning brightly. Right? This light is entrusted to you to be kept burning brightly. Right? That's the amazing vocation that you've all been called to, is to keep that light of Christ burning brightly, in the hearts of your children, which means that that light needs to be fanned into flame, right? That's the way that we fan that light into flame, by passing on the faith to our children, making sure that they're receiving proper religious education, but also how we're passing on our experience of God to our kids. Right? And to keep that light burning brightly, we also have to protect it from the winds and the kind of storms in our society, right? We have to both build it up and protect it from being blown out by the culture, right? Who has the key role in doing this? You do, right? You have the key role in doing this. You know, I cannot keep that light burning brightly if you're not on board with keeping that light burning brightly, right? The hardest thing to teach a child when I was teaching high school is to teach a child whose parents don't go to mass on Sundays. Right? It's the hardest thing because the kid gets put in this crazy circumstance, right? Because you're teaching the Ten Commandments, right? Third commandment, keep holy the Sabbath day. Father, what does that mean? Well, it means that the Sabbath day is set aside as a day of rest and a day to recharge with Jesus. And we do that principally by attending Mass on Sundays. So if you don't go to Mass on Sunday, is that a sin? Yes, it's a sin. Is it a mortal sin? Well, technically, it's grave matter, and if you know that it's a grave sin to avoid going to Mass and you choose that freely, then yes, that meets the qualifications for a mortal sin. In a mortal sin, you go to hell. So, yes, if somebody's in a state of mortal sin, they know it's grave matter, they've chosen it freely, then that would be a rejection of God, and so that person would kind of be choosing 
to go to hell. So then the child's put in this position like, okay, so either father's right and my mom and dad are going to hell, or my mom and dad are really good and everything father says is up for grabs. Right? It puts them in this position of contradiction. Right? And it's very hard to preach the gospel into that. You know, everything begins at home. The biggest indicator that your children will practice the faith when they get to college is what your faith experience is like in your families. Right? It's the biggest indicator. There are kids who, you know, their families might be disengaged and they go on a youth retreat. And on that youth retreat, they have some kind of conversion and they remain and they kind of take off. But for the most part, right, there's a direct correlation between what goes on at home and what goes on after they leave the house. Right? So when we talk about the gospel of the family, what do we mean? The gospel is the good news. And it's the good news proclaimed about the family, right? How we proclaim the gospel about what the family is. But it's also the good news proclaimed to the family and proclaimed by the family. Right? When I was in graduate school, one of the lines my professors would use all the time is that the family has to be the subject and object of the new evangelization. Like, in other words, we have to evangelize families about what it means to be a family. Right? The subject and object of evangelization. And Pope Benedict XVI, when he was talking to the Pontifical Council on the family, said this, the new evangelization depends largely on the domestic church. In our time, as in times past, the eclipse of God, the spread of ideologies contrary to the family, and the degradation of sexual ethics are connected. And just as the eclipse of God and the crisis of the family are linked, so the new evangelization is inseparable from the Christian family. The family is indeed the way of the church because it is the human space of our encounter with Christ. Right? So the domestic church right, is the most important part of the church when we talk about the new evangelization. Right? And the way that we do evangelization in the church is we have to kind of examine that, right? Because sometimes, what do we do? We break up families for the sake of doing evangelization. Right? Dad goes to the men's ministry. Mom goes to her mom's Bible study. Kids go to God teens. And so they're all going to encounter Jesus in these separate spaces. And then they get back together as a family. Oh, how was men's group? Good. Don't ask me about that. That's my group. Right? How much crosstalk is there? Right? And sometimes we're actually like breaking up families for the sake of doing evangelization. Right? But the most important evangelization that can take place is the evangelization that takes place at home between parents and children. Right? The best evangelization talk I ever heard was probably the worst evangelization talk that you would ever hear. Right? And it went kind of like this. I was talking to my dad. I was going to Mass to serve at like Saturday night in Pinckney, Michigan, where I grew up. And I asked my dad, Dad, why are we Catholic? And this was his answer. I tried to live without the ch God for a really long time, and it just didn't work. The end. Lighthouse Catholic Media is not putting it on a CD. <laughs> right? But because it was my dad who told me this, it stayed kind of burned in my head. So when I went to college, and I thought about not getting up for Mass on Sunday, Dad's voice in my head. I tried to live without the church for a really long time, and it just didn't work. And I got up, and I went to Mass. Because if it didn't work for him, it probably wouldn't work for me. When I was in the Army, and I was out partying on Saturday night, and Sunday morning rolled around, and I didn't really feel healthy. I tried to live without the church for a really long time, but it just didn't work. And I'd get up and go to Mass. Right? And that really kept me faithful. It was this witness from my dad. And my dad wasn't like an uber Catholic guy who was up praying the, you know, with scripture every single day or anything like that. But his example and that one line kept me engaged moving forward. Right? Because his answer to that question was, it was kind of a provoking answer. Right? Like, how do we answer that question? Why are we Catholic? Because sometimes we answer that question because we have the Eucharist, because we're the true church, because we have apostolic succession. And those are all good answers. They're all catechetical answers. But 
the real answer to that question, like what are our kids looking for, is they want a reason to be in relationship with Jesus. Right? How many times do we kind of tell this story of, I tried to live without the church for a really long time, but it just didn't work? Because it implies I was once a sinner, and then Jesus entered into my life and changed something, and now I'm following him wherever he's leading me. It's a more compelling story. Right? Because in the scope of evangelizing, evangelization has to do with bearing witness. So the domestic church. Pope Benedict says, in our time as in times past, the eclipse of God, the spread of ideologies contrary to the family and the degradation of sexual ethics are connected. Right? And we can see that in our media, right? In the media that our kids consume, there are all kinds of examples of this degradation of sexual ethics, which also are causing an eclipse of God, right? We can't see God because there's so many anti-love, anti-family messages coming at us every day, right? Every day. How many anti-family messages do we consume through the media every day? You know, whether that's watching a television show that celebrates um, a homosexual marriage, whether that's watching a television show that celebrates the transgender character, uh, whether that's watching a television show where promiscuity is the norm and it's sort of the way that people figure out if they like each other, right? There are lots of places where we consume these anti-love, anti-family messages, right? As a church, like how much are we preaching about the positive perspective on the family, love, marriage, relationship? You know, how many homilies do we hear about that in a given year? You know, it probably depends on who is preaching. But I'd say that in general, we're losing the marketing bout battle, right? Why do people buy things? Product placement. You know, I smoke American Spirit cigarettes because I'm a bad person. But why do I smoke that brand? Because I once watched a television show and this guy had his yellow pack of cigarettes and I was like, huh, those look interesting. I'm going to try those, right? Just kind of saw it. Product placement. That's how it works. So the question is, how much product placement for the gospel do we do every day in our family life? In Amoris Laetitia, which is the new document on the family, Pope Francis writes, the Synod Fathers also wish to emphasize that one of the fundamental challenges facing families today is undoubtedly that of raising children, made all the more difficult and complex by today's cultural reality and the powerful influence of the media. The Church assumes a valuable role in supporting families, starting with Christian initiation, through welcoming communities. At the same time, I feel it important to reiterate that the overall education of children is the most serious duty and at the same time a primary right of parents. Right? So the church wants to say to you, we understand that it is really hard to raise children in the modern world. Right? And so we're called to provide support and give tools to parents in raising your kids in the modern world. Same document, number 274. In the family, we can also learn to be critical about certain messages sent by the various media. Sad to say, some television programs or forms of advertising often negatively influence and undercut the values inculcated in family life, right? This is a church magisterial document, not just Father Kokali saying, like, TV is bad. The educational process that occurs between parents and children can be helped or hindered by the increasing sophistication of the communications and entertainment media. When well used, these media can be helpful for connecting family members who live apart from one another, like when you Skype with grandma. But frequent con in frequent contacts help to overcome difficulties. Still, it is clear that these media cannot replace the need for more personal and direct dialogue, which requires physical presence or at least the hearing the voice of the other person. I think that line is so interesting when we think about the way we communicate today, right? Like the church in a magisterial document says, we need to at least hear the voice of the other person, right? Because so often our young people, by the time they get to high school, they could go through a whole day socializing with their friends and never hear the voice of another person, right? And they're bouncing around, you know? And I'm not saying all social media is bad. Right? But social media, I think, is leading to a lot of depression in the young people that I work with. Right? Because what you do is you just now have six different ways to be rejected. Right? When I was growing up, I'd get home and I'd be kind of bored, so I'd pick up the phone, I'd call my friend and say, hey, what's up? Nothing. What's up with you? Nothing. Then we just sit there and grunt at each other for a while. 
And eventually we'd hang up the phone. Well, today, when they're feeling the same emotion, like I'm feeling kind of lonely or I'm feeling kind of bored, they pull out their phone and they check their Instagram account. Uh, there's nothing going on there. Nobody's really like reaching out to me or communicating with me. Then they check their Twitter account. Uh, and there's nothing going on here. Nobody's really reaching out to me. And then they check their email maybe. Uh, nobody's contacting me here. And then they might check Facebook if they're still using Facebook. And then they go back to their Instagram account, right? So you could get rejected like eight times in 45 seconds, right? Happens to us too. Like how many of us have pulled out our phone and like Facebook, email, Instagram, Facebook, email, and like, why doesn't anybody contact me? <laughs> right, when you could just dial a phone number and get immediate feedback, right? One time I was talking to a high school kid and I said, I want you to call a friend. Um, your assignment is to call a friend this week just for the heck of it and talk to him. What am I supposed to say? <laughs> you just say, hey, what are you doing? Father, that's awkward. I don't know what I'm, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. Right? It's like a challenge to enter into dialogue with someone. Right? And so what can we do to help our young people to experience communion and love? Now, in Familiaris Consortio, it says this, therefore it must be emphasized once more that the pastoral intervention of the church in support of the family is a matter of urgency. Every effort should be made to strengthen and develop pastoral care of the family, which should be treated as a real matter of priority in the certainty that future evangelization depends largely on the domestic church, right? That's the same line that Pope Benedict took and he was quoting, but this was written in like 1981. Right? That it should be a priority of the church to strengthen and develop pastoral care of the family. Okay? And as a church, we have to examine our conscience. Like when I became family life office director, I was taking this very seriously because I recognized that a lot of times there isn't very strong pastoral care for the family. And when my parents got divorced, my dad went to his pastor and the pastor was doing his best. He was doing what he knew how to do. But my dad went and talked to him. And he's like, my, you know, I just got divorced. And I don't know what to do. And, and my dad's experience of that was the pastor just said to him, well, come back when you're ready to get an annulment. And maybe that'll make you feel better. He didn't want an annulment. He just wanted somebody to say, I'm sorry that happened to you. I'm here to support you. Let me walk with you in this. That's what he wanted. You know, he wanted a communion or a community of care. So when we talk about new evangelization, there's really like three different kind of levels. So traditional evangelization is when we proclaim the gospel to the unchurched. This is like when you go to a foreign country and you build a hospital and you start healing people. And then people are like, why are you here doing this for us? And you say, this person Jesus sent me because I just have experienced this amazing encounter with him and now I want to pass it on to you. And they're like, wow, I want to know who this person Jesus is. And then they start a dialogue and then eventually they get catechized and they become Catholic. Right? That's traditional evangelization. Pastoral care is a term that refers to the work we do to enrich and deepen the faith of those who are already in the church. So pastoral care is... Like, okay, you're already Catholic, you have a relationship with Christ, and so now I want to help you go deeper. So new evangelization is a term we use that presupposes that there are people in the church who have received pastoral care without being evangelized. Right? That we sort of, we're going through the motions, we receive the sacraments, we go to Mass on Sunday, but if I ask the question, who is Jesus? Uh... What do you mean, who is Jesus? Like, who is Jesus? Or who are you to Jesus? So when we look at that, kind of in a chart, there's evangelization. Ad gentes, that's unchurched people. Pastoral care. Pastoral care means these people are fervent. They've said yes to Jesus. They've surrendered their life. They have a profound Christian outlook. They bear witness and they make evangelizers of the evangelized. Right? How many people does that really like, describe? in our parishes. You know, most of us, we don't really know who our Lord is. And that's okay to admit that. I was ordained a priest. I don't think I really knew who our Lord was when I was ordained a priest, if I'm honest. I mean, I knew who he was. I wanted to be a priest. Did I have a sense of like, really how much he loved me? No, not a chance. 
you know, and that's unfolded over time. Pope Francis says the thing the church needs most today is the ability to heal wounds and warm the hearts of the faithful. It needs nearness and proximity. I see the church as a field hospital after battle. It's useless to ask a seriously injured person if he has high cholesterol or about the level of his blood sugars. You have to heal his wounds. Then we can talk about everything else. Heal the wounds, heal the wounds. And you have to start from the ground up. Right? And so when we talk about a field hospital, there's triage. An infamiliar consortio, that document on the family that John Paul II wrote, he talks about three kinds of families, but there are also three kinds of people. He says, The church wishes to speak and offer her help to those who are already aware of the value of marriage and family and seek to live it faithfully, right? So those are those people who have already surrendered their life to our Lord. To those who are uncertain and anxious and searching for the truth. So there's this second group of people who... They're in the church, they're coming to Mass on Sundays, but they're, they're not really sure they believe everything the church teaches. And then this third group of people, those who are unjustly impeded from living freely their family lives. Right? And he's talking about social injustices, but this also applies to those of us who come from difficult family lives or distorted family lives, from children who have divorced parents, from families where there's an addicted family system, from people who just have never really encountered love, right? What's unjustly impeding the life of love of our young people? A lot of times it's exposure to internet pornography when they're very young. And for those three groups of people, there's three methods of transmitting the faith, right? Kerygma is the first proclamation of Christ's saving love, right? It's like preaching the gospel to somebody who doesn't know who Jesus is. Right. And then there's catechesis, where we teach people about the faith in order to go deeper. And then doctrine and morals, where we really go deeper and we kind of examine moral questions. Pope Francis talks about the order of these things. He says, a beautiful homily or a genuine sermon must begin with the first proclamation, with the proclamation of salvation. There's nothing more solid, deep, and sure than this proclamation. Then you have to do catechesis. Then you can draw even a moral consequence, but the proclamation of the saving love of God comes before moral and religious imperatives. Today it seems that the opposite order is prevailing. Right? And so he's talking about the way we transmit the faith. And so there's first proclamation of Christ's saving love, then there's catechesis, and then there's doctrine and morals. And oftentimes when people ask us difficult questions, we start with doctrine and morals. Right? We start with doctrine and morals. And I made this mistake when I was teaching high school because high school kids like to entrap their teachers right, and ask like, questions that would take a book to answer and they expect a 30 second answer. Right? And so this question goes kind of like this, like, Father, why does the church, like, why is the church against gay people? A common question today. And so I have choices about how I can answer this question. right? Now, if I start with doctrine and morals, I'm probably going to start with Homosexual acts are a grave sin, and they're against nature, and people who commit them are in mortal sin, and they go to hell. Hmm. So if I start off there, where's this conversation going to go? Immediately, somebody has a family member who's in a same-sex relationship, <laughs> and their relationship actually like, is probably, it might even be healthier at the level of friendship than many of the heterosexual married couples in the same family. And then they give that counterexample, and then they're like, so what do you think of that, father? Uh, then we're kind of stuck, right? We're stuck when we start there, right? Starting with the kerygma means like every single person is created for love and every single person is created as a beloved son or daughter of God. And no matter what they do in their life, that never changes the fact that God loves them because God loves us even when we're in some kind of sin, and sometimes asking the question to a person, do you know how much God loves you? Like, you, would, you just end up fighting about whether or not God loves them. Which is a much more interesting conversation to have. And so starting there, and then we can go from we're created to love to like what that looks like and kind of go down the road. But it gives a lot more space. 
right? It gives a lot more space because it, at the end of the day, a lot of us don't really know that God loves us. I have this 17 year old, he comes to see me because his grandma makes him. So grandma called me one day, father, Jesus told me you're supposed to be my grandson's spiritual director. Okay. <laughs> what else did he tell you? Um, Okay, so I'll meet with him. So he comes in to see me, and I know that Grandma makes him. And so the first conversation is like, do you really want to be here, or are you just here because Grandma made you? Well, I don't care. He's like got his hat down here and sitting back. So we just talked about anything, you know, like what's going on in school. I didn't say Jesus' name during this conversation. Just like, tell me about your life, and how many fights have you been in lately, and what's going on at home, and we got to know each other. And in about two months of this kind of meeting, or three months of this kind of meeting, I said to him, do you know how much, you know our Lord loves you, right? And he looks at me and he goes, hey, he loves everybody. Huh. No, like, do you know he loves you? Like, your name. In a unique, exclusive, and unrepeatable way, he loves you. Hey, he loves everybody. Right? As if to say... God loves me, but it's because he loves everybody, and he just kind of has to love me because I just happen to be part of the everybody. So it doesn't really count because he has to. And so we kind of talked about that. I was like, no, he doesn't love you because you're part of the everybody. If he was looking at all of the people in the world, he would focus in on you, and he would focus in on me, and he would focus in on everybody else in the room. But he loves you in a unique way. He loved you when your dad left when you were a kid. He loved you when you got in trouble at school and you went home and it caused like another fight with your grandparents. He loved you when you, know, you were doing drugs last year. And then he kind of leaves in a stupor. Two months later, he's on my calendar. I was having a busy day and I was like, oh man, I gotta go meet with this kid. I show up at the office and there's like him and grandma and two other kids. And I'm like, what the heck? Did they start a drug ring? So he grabs an extra chair, brings it into my office. He's like, Father, these are my, I went to Mass last weekend and I went to Mass the week before and I went to confession last Sunday and these are my friends and they want to talk to you. Talk. <laughs> what happened? He started to believe that truth about himself, right? He started to believe that our Lord loved him and then he wanted to go tell other people about it. Right? That's how evangelization works. Right? That's how evangelization works. And, and, but it take over and over and over again repeating this truth about himself because he's got this voice in his head that says like he's a bad person and nobody's really there for him and nobody really cares about him. You know, and going through, if I started with, you know you have to go to Mass on Sunday because if you don't, you're in mortal sin and you'll probably go to hell and it's your duty to do it. He wouldn't have gone to Mass on Sunday and told his friends how amazing like, this person is. He had to have an encounter. Right? He had to have an encounter. Pope Benedict often said, like, people don't fall in love with a doctrine, they fall in love with a person. Right? They fall in love with a person. You know, but sometimes we find it very difficult to talk about the person. Right? To talk about the person. Because as Catholics, like after the Protestant Reformation, we tend to always emphasize the things that make us uniquely Catholic. So we talk about the Eucharist and we talk about the sacraments. And so sometimes um, we can talk about the Eucharist and we can say the Eucharist and we never say the word Jesus. You know, when you say, I'm going to adoration, I'm going to Eucharistic, I'm going to go adore the Eucharist. Why don't we say, I'm going to go adore Jesus? Because it is Jesus, but it's kind of more personal. It makes us feel kind of... So the, the way that we use language and how we talk about that. Enjoy the gospel. Pope Francis talks about this again when he talks to catechists. He says, on the lips of the catechists, the first proclamation must ring out over and over. Jesus Christ loves you. He gave his life to save you, and now he's living at your side every day to enlighten, strengthen, and free you. The first proclamation is called first, not because it exists at the beginning and can then be forgotten or replaced by other more important things. It's first in a qualitative sense. Right? It's first in a qualitative sense. So this idea of Jesus Christ loves you, he gave his life to save you, he walks by your side every day to enlighten, strengthen, and free you. That should be coming out of our mouths all of the time. Right? All of the time. 
How many times do our kids hear that? You know, when I do formation for teachers, I challenge them, like, on all of your lesson plans, you should write down kerygma. Like, somewhere today, I'm going to tell these kids how much our Lord loves them and what our Lord has done for them and that they are beloved sons and daughters of the Father, that our Lord loves them in a unique, unrepeatable, and exclusive way. You know, and that experience of the kerygma, it changes us, right? It changes us. When I was in fourth grade... I had a little conversion. It was probably like one of my first little conversions. And I had it at an evangelical church, right? I had a friend who went to Awanas. Does anybody know what Awanas is? Right? It's a it's a Protestant youth group. You go there, you memorize Bible verses, you pass them off, you pass the book, you get badges, and then you go play games, and then you end up in a sermon. And the sermon, it's almost always the same. The sermon goes kind of like this: like, Jesus can come back at any time. And so if you have not yet invited Jesus into your heart, I invite you all right now to turn your life over to him who has saved you. And so I ask you all, just put your heads down. Just put your heads down. So I'm sitting there and my head's down. I'm like, uh. It's like, if you want to invite Jesus into your heart right now, I invite you to raise your hand. One of our brothers and sisters be around to pray with you. And so I remember being in fourth grade and I'm sitting there with my head down on this pew and am I going to raise my hand or not raise my hand? This is really serious. And I raised my hand and somebody put their hand on my shoulder and they said this prayer. And, uh, and something happened, right? There, there wasn't a sacrament, but there was a kind of a movement inside of me to say, I want Jesus to be part of my life every single day in my heart. And it changed something about the way I prayed. Right? Because then from that point on, when I prayed the standard prayers we know as Catholics, when I prayed the Our Father, and I said things like, lead us not into temptation, I would be thinking about the temptations I wanted him to lead me not into. Like I was talking to a real person. When I did the act of contrition, when I was in confession, and I said, I firmly resolve with the help of your grace to sin no more and avoid the near occasions of sin, and then I would find myself in an occasion of sin, I would be thinking about, well, I told Jesus, this person, it's in my life, that I was going to avoid these occasions of sin, and so I need to get out of here. You know, when I went to bed at night, I would have conversations with our Lord, right? And those conversations were the conversations of a fourth grader. So they were kind of like, Jesus, I know you can come back at any time, but please wait till after Saturday, because I really want to go to the amusement park with my friends. Right? I mean, it's a fourth grader prayer. But it changed something subjectively. It changed something about the way I thought about having a relationship with our Lord. And it was important. Right? It was important. When our kids get confirmed, they do something more than that. Like they go up and they kneel down in front of the bishop. And the bishop changes their name. And he puts his hand on their forehead. He says, you know, so-and-so, Kateri, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's this moment of giving their life over to our Lord. And they, as fifth graders, they should have as much sort of, oh, this is a really big deal, and now I'm really surrendering my life to our Lord, and I'm going to live in a relationship with Him every day, as I had when I was in fourth grade. Right? As I had when I was in fourth grade. But sometimes we just get like, stuck in, like, this is just what we do because we're in fifth grade. And like, how do we call that out of them to really have that experience, right? They can have an experience of God in fifth grade. So the kerygma about the family, right, is about finding our family in the family of Christ. So these questions, how did you find Jesus, right? How do we answer that question? Like, how did we find Jesus? Better yet, how did Jesus find you? Right. How did Jesus find you? Like, have we thought about that ourselves? Like, how did our Lord find me? You know, when St. Paul tells his conversion story, like whenever St. Paul's challenged about his authority, he just tells his conversion story. And he says, you know, the one who knit me together in my mother's womb saw fit to call me out of this life of sin. So it implies that the Lord has always known me since my conception. He's been walking with me all this time, even when I was persecuting the church. And then one day he showed up in my life and he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And it changed everything. And then I started to follow him. 
Right? Then I started to follow him. And I can't help but to proclaim the gospel because of the amazing things our Lord has done in my life. Like, how did Jesus find you? Why are we Catholic? Right? I talked about how my dad answered this question. Why are we Catholic? You know, how are we going to answer that question? Right? How amazing would it be for your kids to hear you say, you know, there was a time in my life when I wasn't really sure about all this Catholic stuff. And then I found myself in this situation where I knew that I really needed our Lord. And I just cried out to him in prayer one day, and he answered me. And ever since then, I just never want to be separated from him. Right? Just cracking open and sharing what our Lord has done in our lives. Because at the end of the day, we're talking about living a life of love in relationship with our Lord. John Paul II in his first encyclical says, Man cannot live without love. He remains a being that is incomprehensible to himself. His life is senseless if love is not revealed to him. If he does not encounter love, if he does not experience it and make it his own, if he does not participate intimately in it. Right? All of us are searching for love and communion and connectedness with our Lord, within our marriages, within our family life. And if that's true, that this is the most important thing in our lives, then the devil has a plan for love in our lives. And Jesus tells us in Luke's gospel, Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat. Right? To sift all of you like wheat. And I always imagine a family and they're sitting around the table and they're laughing and they're you know, telling stories and maybe playing pitch or something like that. And then this big sifter comes under the table and the devil starts cranking on the sifter and everybody comes out the bottom like staring at their iPhones. <laughs> right? Because sometimes that's what our families look like and we don't even mean it for it to happen. Giving a talk to a bunch of junior high kids, I said, how many of you have ever been waiting for dad to come home from work and you're excited to tell him about your day and you run up to him and you're going to tell him something and he says, hang on, I got to answer this real quick. Every single hand went up. How did that make you feel? Second, second rate? Unimportant? Like it don't matter? You know, we don't do it on purpose, but sometimes like technology has invaded our life so much and it gets in the way of face-to-face -face communication. Right? And one time I had a meeting with the bishop, and the bishop did this to me. Like, first two minutes of the meeting, he's sitting there like this. And I felt second rate, unimportant, like he really doesn't want to be in this meeting with me right now. And I felt all those things, you know. And I'm sure that I do it to people, too. You know, I'm really busy. I crank out. Like, I got eight appointments in a day. My only chance to check emails is in between those appointments. You know, so I put Jesus on the back of my phone. So I was like, at least they'll know Jesus loves them. Right? <laughs> kind of joking, but... I have to be cognizant of that too, right? Because technology does do that. There's this experiment, this psychological experiment called the still face experiment. And um, you can find it online. You can see Google uh, video. And it basically was an experiment where they took infants and their moms. And the infant and their mom would be interacting. And the mom's like, ah, you know, playing these games. And the child's like reacting to the mom and mirroring and all of that kind of stuff that babies do. You know, like when you smile, they smile. And then they had the mom turn around and turn back and be non-responsive. And you watch this baby, like, try to get the mom's attention. The baby starts pointing at things, using all of their, all of their sort of tools in order to get the mom to engage. They start yelling, like crying. And then you see the baby just kind of go like this. <clears throat> and have this experience of shame. And this is like a two-month-old, three-month-old baby. Right? because of the non-responsiveness of the parent. And that experiment has been replicated with media, right? where they just have like, the parent pull out their phone and look at their phone while the child's trying to engage with them. And same results. Right? And it's just a very core experience of people aren't here to respond to me. Right? It's fascinating. These are things. I'm not saying like you're a bad person or I'm, you know, Lord knows, I need a lot of mercy because I've done this to people too. But we need to be cognizant of it. And so the devil wants to sift all of you like wheat. And when we think about communication, like communication has made communion and love more difficult. Like we, it objectively has made it more difficult. Why? Because some of us, when we were growing up, we had this kind of communication, right? Party line phone, 
One phone number, four households, no privacy, no anonymity, everybody knows your business, right? That was the norm for some of us growing up, right? Less and less of us as we're getting older. So then we got more technologically advanced and we put a phone in the kitchen on a short cord, right? 10 o'clock in the morning, a girl calls me in junior high, mom starts making supper, right? What are you doing? Making supper. It's in 10, it's in seven hours. I know, I'm just getting ahead of my day. Who are you talking to? All right, she's spying on me. No, I don't know. Maybe she was spying on me, but mostly I think she just wanted to know who I was talking to and what was going on in my life. So some of you got really long cords and you went to the pantry to talk on the phone. Right? <laughs> and then we got more technologically advanced. We got cordless phones, right? And I remember getting a cordless phone when I was a teenager and thinking, oh, this is awesome. Now I can have privacy when I'm talking to my friends or my girlfriend or whatever. Right? Then we got email. Instant messaging, we invented a new language where we hardly ever communicate real feelings. Social media, right? The goal of social media is to become more and more anonymous and private, right? All the different social media platforms that come out, the new ones that come out, the goal of it is to make it more anonymous and private, right? There's a reason that kids are not on Facebook, right? There's like all these sociological studies. Teenagers do not prefer Facebook anymore as a form of social media. Why? Because grandma uses Facebook. Right? That's why they're not on Facebook. I ask kids all the time, why don't you use Facebook? Facebook's for old people. Right? And so they get new social media platforms that mom and dad don't understand so that they can move farther and farther away. Right? They don't know they're doing it maliciously or anything, but that's kind of how it happens. Right? And social media platforms are the primary place where sexual predators hang out now. Right? The creepy guy at the roller skating rink doesn't hang out at the roller skating rink anymore. He hangs out on social media platforms. Right? And we have to remember that. Like, Have I had a parent with their seventh grade daughter in my office who had been dialoguing with a sexual predator? Yes. She met this really nice boy in Canada who taught her how to get a Skype account so that they could talk more frequently. And they met just on a gaming app. Right, like Tetris with a social media function. And then they started talking and like, this person's interested in me, this is so amazing. And then set up a Skype account, send me your address, send me pictures. Right, most often those send me pictures like bleed into send me naked pictures. Right, so we have to be vigilant about that because it is the devil wants to sift all of you like wheat. Handheld devices and Snapchat, right? Snapchat is the most popular way that young people communicate now. Okay? You can make, you make your own decisions about whether or not you let your kids have Snapchat. Okay? In my experience of talking to many people across the country, Snapchat, if your daughters have Snapchat, by the time they get to college, some creepy boy is going to ask them to send them naked pictures. Okay? It's become part of a subculture. Right? Is it happening in the Diocese of Lincoln where everything is good? Yes. It is. I've gotten that call from locally. I've gotten that call from Western Nebraska. So it's just an occasion of somebody's going to try to exploit your kid if they have Snapchat. Okay? And you have to just be super careful and you need to be in dialogue with them about that. Right? So, so what's the good news? Right? The good news is that the way that we navigate this culture, the way we evangelize in this culture, is the way we always have evangelized. Right? And the story of scripture, the story of salvation, gives us kind of a roadmap for that. Right? And the story of scripture goes like this. God created the world and everything was good. Then something happened called original sin. And things became distorted. Right? You can still tell what it is. It's just not clear. So the family, when things were good, was a mom, dad, and their natural children. Okay? The family in distortion is the family of Israel or the family of Jacob. Right? Jacob fell in love with a woman, wanted to marry her, went to the dad. Can I have permission to marry your daughter? Yes, go to that tent tonight. Goes to that tent, wakes up the next morning. Ah, wrong sister. Got tricked into marrying the uglier older sister, Leah. So he had to wait seven more years to marry the woman he loves. Finally marries the woman he loves, but she can't have babies. So she says, we'll take my concubine and have babies with her. And then Leah gets jealous and says, we'll take my concubine and have babies with her. And then Rachel finally has babies. So the family in distortion is one dad, four moms, 12 brothers who all hate each other and sell Joseph to the Egyptians. Right? It's just like the Kilcalli family. <laughs> it's like a lot of our families. But then what happens? Jesus enters into that family. 
right? Our Lord enters into that family. He doesn't just enter into the holy family of Nazareth. So many times when we preach on the family, we say, be like the holy family of Nazareth, right? And all the moms in the pews would just start going, I wasn't conceived without sin. That's impossible. And my husband is not St. Joseph. <laughs> right? It can seem like an impossible standard. Right? So we have to remember that our Lord entered into that family. In Matthew chapter 1, Christmas Eve, we hear that gospel, Abraham was the father of Isaac, was the father of Jacob. And now who else do we hear about? Tamar. Tamar lost two husbands, had to go be a widow for a while. Judah never sent anybody for her. And then she heard her father-in-law is coming to town. So she dresses up like a prostitute, seduces her father-in-law, gets pregnant by him. So he finally has to take care of her. Not the holy family of Nazareth. And then Rahab, the prostitute. Then Ruth, pagan, not a member of the people of God. And then Bathsheba. And at the end of that long list of people, it says, then was born Jesus. So if Jesus can be born into that family, he can be born into my family. And he can be born into your families. So that we can grow in clarity and virtue. And eventually, at the end of time, enter into the kingdom of God. Or the wedding feast of the Lamb. Right? That's also my autobiography. <laughs> And yours, right? I was born into a world where everything was good. Then something happened. My mom died when I was two. My dad was an alcoholic. He was kind of distant in the house growing up. I got exposed to pornography for the first time when I was 10 at a neighbor's house who had kind of an irresponsible dad with Playboy magazines everywhere. Saw my first pornography video when I was 14 at my brother's house because we were having like a rite of passage weekend. Then when I was in high school, I had kind of weak masculine identity and didn't really get along well with guys and all the older guys spread rumors about me that I was gay, right? All those things are things that happened. And they caused the distortion about how I saw myself, how I saw God, how I understood relationships. But then Jesus entered into my life, right? Several times in order to bring clarity, right? In order to reveal to me who I am, and to heal whatever needed to be healed. That's what he wants to do with each and every one of us. Right? We all have this story. But sometimes when we tell our conversion story, we don't want to tell that story. You know, I ask sometimes even focused missionaries, I'm like, tell me your conversion story. And they're like, well, I was growing up and I didn't really know the faith. And so I was you know, committing lots of sins because I didn't really know the faith. And so then I got to college and I read a Peter Kreef book and then I like knew the faith. And so I started like being good after that. Where was Jesus in that story? Like where was Jesus in that story? Because somewhere I was a sinner and our Lord entered into my life and he loved me anyways. Right? He loved me anyways. That's the story of our, our conversion story is I was lost and I got found. St. Paul, he's like, I persecuted Christians. And then Jesus entered into my life and then changed everything. You know, how do we tell our own conversion stories? And how do we tell our own story to, how do we pass our own story on to our kids? And sometimes there can be great anxiety about that. Should you tell your kids every single mortal sin you ever committed in your youth? Probably not. Can you tell them that you once didn't really know our Lord and then you came to know him? Yes. Can you tell them you weren't always perfect? Yes. Because sometimes we just want to erase that part of our life. And then it keeps us from experiencing mercy. One time a woman was in my office and we were talking and, and, uh, and she had had like kind of, you know, a dark past. Not super dark, but dark. She thought it was dark. And I asked her this question. What if you and college you were sitting in my office right now and Jesus was knocking on the door? What would you do? Oh, Father, I would kick college me out of the room and in the courtyard. <laughs> okay, so who would Jesus rather hang out with, you or college you? Well, I hope both of us. Okay, in the Gospels, who would Jesus have dinner with, you or college you? Ugh, college me. Right? Because she never really allowed our Lord to love her anyways in that moment. She never really allowed herself to receive mercy. Right? And it's mercy that brings us to conversion. In the scriptures, everybody who has a conversion has a conversion because they experience mercy. And mercy is love that goes beyond the demands of justice. 
So like the prodigal son, when does he have a conversion? Okay, in the pigsty, he has an intellectual conversion. He realizes he's made some mistakes. There's consequences for his mistakes. He can't take care of himself. And he deserves to just die there. But he's going to go ask his father if he can just be a hired servant. right? So he has to make up a speech for his father. And the speech, so he's like, okay, uh, father, I've sinned against heaven against you. Okay, I better admit that. That sounds good. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Okay, that's the money line. So that's my speech. Then he starts walking home. And I sort of imagine him walking home and he's like, Father, I've sinned against heaven against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Father, I've sinned against heaven against you. I no longer deserve. Right? When you get in a fight with your spouse and you're out in the driveway, you're doing your speech. And, he, and so he's practicing his speech and he gets up to the property line and he sees the father running towards him. And what comes into his head? Oh man, he's coming to run me off. I got to get my speech out. So he starts his speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Stop. Gets interrupted. Father throws his arms around him and hugs him. Oh, what's going on? And he says, bring a ring and put it on his finger. Put sandals on his feet. Put the finest robe on him because my son, my son, was dead and he has come to life again. And when he hears the words, my son, that's what changes his heart. He was about to say, I no longer deserve to be called your son. When he experiences that love that goes beyond the demands of justice, that's when he has a conversion. Right? The woman caught in adultery is the same thing. Right? Like she, had, she was a prostitute. So how does a person become a prostitute? Well, probably the same way lots of people become a prostitute today. Like she was probably sexually abused when she was a kid or her family life was a mess. Um, maybe she was raped when she was younger and nobody would marry her because it's very important to marry a virgin. And she realized like in her head, I don't deserve to have real love in my life. I don't deserve to have a family. The best I can do is just sort of like use my body in order to get by in life. I have no value except for my bodily value. And she goes from man to man to man to man to man. And all the while probably hating herself for what she's doing. She might have even wanted to die at some points. And then one day she's with a client and all these men barge into the house and they interrupt right in the midst of committing adultery, right? It says this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. And so they drag her out into the street, not wearing very many clothes, throw her down in front of our Lord. This big crowd of angry men gather around her and she's exposed. Everything she already believes about herself has now become public. So where would she be looking? Down. That's where we look when we feel ashamed. Down. And so they say to Jesus, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Moses says we should stone her. What do you say? And Jesus just bends down and starts writing in the ground. Right? Why? What was he writing? Doesn't matter. Where was she looking? At the ground. So he's just kind of going like, hey, look at my finger. Catch your attention. She probably like looked up, made eye contact, and was like, whoa, why is he looking at me? Right? You know when somebody catches you staring, you're like, Shh. And Then he gets up and he says, whoever among you has no sin can cast the first stone. Then he goes back down. Hey, look at my finger. And this time maybe he catches her eye. And she allows him to look into her eye. And she starts to realize that he looks at her differently than the crowd looks at her. Right? The crowd looking at her, they see that she only has value for her bodily value, that they see her sin. They start thinking about what she had been doing. And they're looking at her with lust. Jesus is looking into her. And she starts to recognize, like, uh, he looks at me differently than everybody else. He looks at me differently than I look at myself. And then the crowd might have noticed, wait a minute. Like Jesus is looking, how does he look at her and not be distracted by her body? Like, how is he just looking at her with love? And then maybe they remember Jesus saying, whoever looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Whoever among you has no sin can cast the first stone and they start dropping their stones and leaving until it's just Jesus and the woman. And then our Lord stands up and he says to her, woman, has no one condemned you? And she says, no one, sir. 
And when she says no one, sir, the no one, sir, includes herself. Right? And seeing how our Lord looks at her, it changes the way she sees herself. And she recognizes that she is lovable, that she does have value. And then he says, go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. And where does she go? She just follows after Jesus. She shows up at the Pharisee's house and starts washing Jesus' feet with her tears. She shows up at the cross. She's the first to discover the empty tomb and carry the faith of southern France. Like, she's transformed by love. Right? She's transformed by love. Because she was living this life of distortion, Jesus entered into her life, loved her even though she was a sinner, and then it, she took off. Right? That's how conversion happens. And when we talk about love and being created for love, the Trinity reveals to us that there's three kinds of love. And these three kinds of love, they're not the kinds of love like eros, agape, philia. <clears throat> but within the Trinity, this is a particular kind of love that we call fatherhood, right? Fatherhood says, I want the good for you. This is sacrificial love. It's active, self-giving love. Right? I want the good for you. It's the kind of love that gets you up in the middle of the night to feed your crying babies. It's the kind of love that gets dads up in the middle of the night, pick up their kids when they're in trouble. This is a different kind of love that the son has for the father. Right? So the vocabulary that we use, it has to be different. Right? Because there's a distinction between fatherhood and sonship. So if the father wants the good for the son, the son responds to that. Like, what do we do? If somebody, if we know somebody absolutely wants the best for us, then we know that we can trust them and we can entrust ourselves to them. Right? In the document Lumen Fide, Pope Francis says, the act of faith is an act by which I entrust my life to a person who wants the good for me. Right? Which really means I give my life into their hands. I surrender myself to them. I could turn off my brain and let them make all my decisions for the rest of the day. And I know that at the end of the day, my life's going to be better than it was at the beginning. Right? How many people can we say that about? Can we even say that about Jesus? No, because if we're honest, that is the most difficult thing that we do. And if we do that right, if we do that completely, then we're saints. Right? Then we're saints. When I went to Rome to study, I found myself for the second time in my life in a classroom learning all this stuff, which was like completely contrary to the way I grew up in my life and it was agitating all my family of origin wounds. And it made me feel kind of depressed. And then when I went to bed at night, I would just fantasize and fall asleep thinking about what would my life be like if only I had a time machine and I could go back and tell Bishop Bruskowitz I'm going back in the army. So I would be fantasizing about, I'd be in Afghanistan right now, I'd be running into all my old friends, I'd be like a lieutenant colonel, and then that fantasy train started going farther. Like, what if I never became a priest in the first place? Like, I'd be a battalion commander leading an infantry battalion. I had Arabic background, so I'd probably be, you know, like, interacting with all these tribes, and I could have single-handedly stopped the war. <laughs> and then I started going further. Like, what if I married my high school girlfriend? I'd have, like, kids who are 15 by now, and... Their names would be... It starts to drift more and more and more and more and more. And what does that do? It gives you more anxiety. It makes you more depressed. and it makes you not live your life in the moment. And I was not entrusting my life to our Lord or the bishop. Right? On that fantasy train. Right? I'm sure in married life it never happens. Right? But... It's pretty common, right? That's what happens. And I remember going out running one day, and I'm running by St. Peter's, and I'm looking up at St. Peter's, and I'm running along the Tiber River, and I said out loud, I want to be a priest. And that was the first time in my entire life I'd ever said the words out loud, I want to be a priest. I was already ordained seven years. You know, and so how did I get ordained if I didn't want to be a priest? Well, I wanted to do whatever God wanted me to do, right? I would always say, I think God wants me to be a priest. Really? That's such an honor? It does. Oh, man. I remember being in the seminary and my spiritual director saying, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to do whatever God wants me to do. Oh, good. You're so holy. It wasn't holy. I was looking for a holy loophole. 
right? Because if I just want to do whatever God wants me to do, then that leaves me some space so that sometime in the future I could say, wait a minute, I was wrong about what God wanted me to do. He really wants me to run off with, you know, the second grade teacher or something like that. Okay, I'm throwing that example out there just because like, that happens to priests, that classmates who that happened to. Right? Because we get confused about our lives. And entrusting our life completely to our Lord means that we, we want to do the thing that he wants for us. So discernment is like, what do you want me to do? I want you to be a priest. Okay, I want to be a priest. And every day, I have to choose to want to be a priest. And when I choose to want to be a priest every day, I have joy. Right? Same thing in marriage. Right? Every day you have to say, I want to be a wife. I want to be a husband. Every day you have to say, I want to be a mom. Every day you have to say, I want to be a dad. You know, and sometimes there's a gap there. Right? It's a natural gap. Like I know lots of women. There's a gap between a positive pregnancy test and I want to be a mom. Right? It involves throwing the pregnancy test at your husband, saying, I knew, I told you it wasn't a green day. Right? It's just my NFP joke. <laughs> right? But that can happen. Right? It, it can happen. It's natural. You're not a bad person. Right? But every day we have to recommit ourselves. Like, I want to be a mom. I want to be a dad. I want to be a husband. I want to be a wife. I want to be a son. I want to be a daughter. I entrust my life to you. And the Holy Spirit is the fruitfulness of the love between the Father and the Son. So Pope Benedict says, The real God is by his very nature entirely being for, being from, and being with. He says, Man, for his part, is God's image, precisely insofar as the from, with, and for constitute the fundamental anthropological pattern. So what does that mean? It means that to be created in the image of God was love. means that all of us are a being from or a son or daughter that entrusts their life completely to a father or a mother. And then we become a being with in friendship, relationships, friendship, love, and eventually spousal love in order to become a parent or a being for. Right? Where there's this sacrificial love that is completely self-giving and disinterested. Right? So there's a pattern of love in our lives. Whenever we try to move out of that pattern, we're not on our way to divinity. We're not the image of God, but we're on our way to dehumanization, is what Pope Benedict says. Right? And so when we think about identity and all the identity conversations that we're having right now, right, identity, in the Christian context, identity is your being from relationship. Right? That's your identity. Right? Our identity is where we're from. And we know that implicitly by the conversations that we've had when we've made friends over time when we say, where are you from? It's the way you get to know somebody. You find out about them because of the context of their lives. When your children are born, they're trying to discover who they are. And you know, when I was a kid, one of the things I loved for people to say to me was, you have your mom's smile. Like, I loved it when old people told me that. The grandparents are great aunts and uncles. You have your mom's smile. Why? Because I didn't know my mom. She died. And it made me feel connected to her. Right? Like, why do I have blue eyes when my parents don't have blue eyes and all my cousins have brown eyes and then I met my maternal grandmother who has these, like, really blue eyes. And I felt like I belonged, like I understood my life better. I remember my sister at three looking at me and going, I'm like you. Huh? We both have blue eyes. Right? And she is identifying with where she's from. Right? And having a sense of belonging. Who's Jesus? What's Jesus' identity? It's Son of God. That's his identity. That's what the Gospels say. The Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Baptism. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Transfiguration. This is my chosen Son. Listen to him. At the end of the Gospel according to Mark, his side is pierced with a lance. And the soldier says, truly, this was the Son of God. Right? Jesus' identity is Son. We live in a world that says identity is your being with relation. Right? You don't have value unless you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Or your identity is your sexual attractions. Or your identity is your sexual arousal. Right? The error is in which relationship we find our identity in. Okay, where do many of us find our identity? We find our identity there in the being for relationship. 
right? I measure myself by how much I volunteer. I measure myself by what I do for people. I measure myself by what I accomplish. Okay, whenever that starts to slip, we're not on our way to the image of God, right? Holiness is when we find our meaning and our value in being beloved sons and daughters of the Father, right? That's what we want to pass on to our young people. And, okay, I think I am going to adjust time. So I'm going to take a break now and then come back and we'll talk about the biblical narrative and, um, and we'll go from there. So, okay, so let's take 10. Does that sound good? Fall asleep. Okay, we'll take